Welcome to beekeeping. What's it all about? This is just a short term video, which really gives you a brief overview of what's involved in beekeeping. Just enough information for you to decide to go further or not, because we've got an online course, Introduction to Beekeeping, which is uh, much more involved. It's about six hours in six sessions, and it's just £15. So beekeeping, what's it all about? It is hosted by the Bee Improvement and Bee Breeders Association, which is an organisation which has been in existence now for uh, well over 50 years. Really, they're involved with uh, improving the bees we've got and perhaps breeding uh, better ones. Fairly recently, uh, we've taken on quite a bit more uh, beekeeping education, beekeeper education, and that's really what this um, event is is for. Uh, so there's the Bibber website. I'll bring it up later so you can uh, you can see it. Now here's an opening statement. Uh, beekeeping is fun. Uh, now, if I was um, uh, a well-known person, um, that would really be a catchphrase because I genuinely think beekeeping is fun and I've been heard to say it on many occasions. I've kept bees since 1963, so that's 56 and a bit years. I'll be 57 in uh, June. Uh, overall, I've met some pretty nice people. Uh, okay, beekeeping is a bit of a cross-section like everything else, but um, uh, there are some really nice people in beekeeping. Uh, it's done me lots of favours, one of which is it's brought me a lot closer to nature. Now, I was uh, born, born and brought up on a farm in West Sussex, um, so I've had my um, nose fairly close to nature anyway, uh, ears, eyes, and all the rest of it. Um, but um, I think beekeeping has helped me get even closer. What I do know is that bees have taught me a huge, huge amount, and I'm hoping to share a little bit of that with you um, in the next hour or so. Uh, but before that, a tiny bit about me. Not that there's too much to say, because uh, I'm fairly insignificant, really. Um, I already mentioned I started in 1963. I've been demonstrating and teaching uh, for nearly 50 years. I think my first demonstration was in 1972, and I've done a huge amount uh, ever since. Carl's mentioned I had 130 colonies. Um, I did them for about 15 years, and that takes or took me, I considered, into being sort of semi-commercial. Um, but I was keeping 130 colonies. I was running uh, my own business. Um, during the summer, I was trying to get two games of cricket in a weekend uh, and also had a young family as well. And um, uh, one of those had to um, take a bit of a backseat for a time, and I'm afraid it was beekeeping. But I was still involved quite heavily because I was involved with uh, – I was still doing – uh, a bit, uh, a few lectures and that sort of thing, and I was still doing teaching at my local beekeeping association or demonstrating rather. Uh, for the last 15 years or so, I've been the apron manager of uh, my local beekeeping association, which is the Whisper Green Beekeepers Association in West Sussex. Uh, I consider I'm a prolific uh, a speaker and demonstrator um, up until the current troubles, certainly for the last. Five years, I've um, given at least uh, 50 um, uh, presentations, lectures, call them what you like, a year, plus demonstrations, and I do a bit of writing as well. Uh, one book I'll tell you about a bit later, and four others that I'm in the um, um, process of finishing at the moment. I travel pretty widely in beekeeping, uh, certainly uh, uh, England, Scotland, uh, Wales and uh, Ireland uh, demonstrating as well and um, I've done a bit on the continent and some in uh, I've also been to the US and Canada uh, as well uh, that puts me in a fairly privileged position of uh, seeing lots of different bees kept by lots of different beekeepers uh, in lots of different conditions and um, that has taught me an awful lot Overall, I'm still pretty passionate about the craft and I can't wait for the season to get going uh, this uh, year. So what's it all about then? Well, it's what it said in the publicity. It's really just a short presentation just to give you folk the absolute basic information 
just so you can say, well, yep, I think I want to go further or perhaps mm, a bit too much in this beekeeping lark. Um, uh, I'll give that a miss. That's absolutely fine. Um, don't worry at all because um, at the end of the day, we should have done everybody a bit of good. This is very definitely not intended to persuade you people to keep bees. Um, there are enough people in beekeeping who, uh, who um, uh, uh, sort of suggest that it's a, it, 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 it's, a, it's a lovely hobby and bees are wonderful and that sort of thing. Yes, they are, but I'm afraid there are a lot of people that have come into beekeeping who probably regretted it because they didn't understand fully what was, what was involved. Please, folks, make the decision yours and base it on base it on a conscious decision. Um, I'll give you a bit of information uh, as we go through, but you need to make absolutely certain that, bearing in mind the nature of it, that um, uh, that you that you think it through. It's not like buying a bicycle and going out on a bike ride, because if you just want to give up or put aside the the um, uh, the cycle riding you can just leave your bike in the shed and no harm will be done this is different because we've got a uh, a living organism and um, we really need to look after it i may well suggest in fact i will suggest a few things that i advise against and as with every other thing there are negatives and positives not everything is is, is wonderful there are a few problems and i think it's reasonable that you folk uh, know about it, so I'm going to be absolutely honest uh, with you. Um, I'm not on a hard selling mission, honest. Now, what about bees? We keep hearing all this pub publicity about bees. Uh, they're in decline or in trouble. You ask people what kind of bees, and they don't know. Which bees? Oh, oh well, yeah, well, bees. Oh, yeah, but what kind of bees? Well, you know, so, sort of bees, aren't they? There are fifteen to 20,000 species worldwide of bees. And people just simply do not realize this. There are around about 250 in mainland UK. Um, some of the islands and Ireland, there are um, a lot less. Um, that's for a variety of reasons. Some of them are species specific and it just don't happen to be the plants there. Uh, or they may not have uh, found their way uh, over the years. They come in two basic groups, social bees and solitary bees. Social bees uh, include uh, bumblebees and our honeybees, and it's beekeepers that keep honeybees. And the reason they keep them is because apart from a few bumblebees that, that are capable of storing perhaps no more than a day or two's uh, food, honeybees can store enough food to keep the whole colony going through um, probably 12, even sometimes up to an 18 month um, uh, a period. And that, of course, is what attracts beekeepers um, to or humans to, uh, to beekeeping. So what do they look like? That is a fairly typical, um, what one might call native-ish, near native uh, honeybee. These are not honeybees. They're both different kinds of bumblebees. Now, out of the 250 species, honeybees, there's only one species. There are several subspecies, um, only one of which is native to uh, our islands. Uh, some others have been Im imported over the years. Of the bumblebees, there are probably 25 or so uh, species of those, and you'll see them... Uh, Put those up there deliberately because they uh, they are very different uh, sorts of bees, but they are, uh, are bumblebees. So where do these bees live then? Naturally, they will live in a cavity in a tree, and I'm sure many of you have seen uh, seen uh, bees in trees. But to in order to manage them, beekeepers put them in a beehive. So here's a little bit about what happens where. Um, this is the floorboard, and above that, we've got a thing called a queen, queen excluder. Now, that queen excluder keeps the queen uh, in an area uh, below that, which we call the brood chamber. So that area there is where all the brood, all the young bees are raised. And then above the queen excluder, we've got what we call supers. 
which is where the honey is stored. And above that is the roof. Now, it's all above the queen's, well, not always all above, but it's above what the queen, the queen excluder, what beekeepers harvest as their crop. Now, to be a beekeeper, there are certain things that are helpful. I've got here need, but they're helpful. <laughs> Reasonably fit, uh, not frightened of being stung. You need to be responsible, have some discipline, caring and understanding. You need a little bit of time. Uh, it's helpful if you're observant and you've got a bit of lateral thinking. You, of course, need somewhere to keep your bees. Uh, you need uh, understanding people around you, either family or neighbours. And uh, you do need a bit of gumption and common sense and practical abilities as well. Now, all of these I'll briefly cover as we go through, which will probably be the main part of the uh, presentation. So being reasonably fit, here's me at the Whisper Green uh, teaching April, taking off a couple of supers from a, uh, uh, a hive. <clears throat> now, when I say reasonably fit, uh, you don't have to be able to roar around all over the place, but there is a bit of lifting to do. Each one of those supers on their own um, can weigh as absolute maximum, um, and I'll stress maximum, 35 to 40 pound or um, uh, 16 to 18 kilos uh, each. The bottom bit, which you call the brood chamber, which is the same thing, but about third, third bigger again, uh, if it was full, uh, 55 to 60 pounds, which is 25 to 27 kilos. Now, I'll tell you that the brew chamber, uh, when it's full, a beekeeper will very, very rarely um, uh, lift it. Right, now, if you've got a bit of a problem with lifting or you are struggling with um, some sort of perhaps disability, don't worry too much because there are other ways of doing it. Inside those boxes, as you'll see later, there are what we call frames with, with combs inside. And you can, at the push, uh, take one of those out individually. Uh, and there's a, uh, between 9 and 11 in, um, uh, in those boxes. So you can keep bees even if you are unable to lift those uh, sort of uh, amounts. Not being frightened of being stung. Well, I have to tell you that you will get stung. Uh, and we do get people come up to, um, up to us up to Whisper Green and shows and that sort of thing. Do you get stung? Well, of course you do. If you go swimming, you'll get wet. So if you don't like being stung, then beekeeping certainly isn't for you. I have to say that from time to time, so will other people. Although bees in general are pretty gentle, very occasionally something can go wrong and it could be something the beekeeper does. And um, uh, perhaps uh, neighbours might get the occasional sting or perhaps your own family. Um, so it's, it's not just you. If you're genuinely frightened of being stung, you probably won't get any better. That's my experience anyway. People come along um first time and if they they look frightened they never seem to be able to um uh, uh to get out of it which is understandable but at the same time uh there's no point forcing yourself to do something that um um that you could uh, spend your time better on on something else <clears throat> i know i'm going to get shot for this and quite frankly i don't mind at all but i suggest strongly that um, you go along to local beekeeping association, go to a meetings and get stung several times before you, um, before you go any further. I don't mean on the same day, but if you get the occasional sting here and there, because what I found is that some, sometimes um, people have virtually no reaction to the first sting or the second one, and then all of a sudden, uh, something happens and they swell up or they blister or whatever. So rather than buy equipment, put it at the bottom of the garden, handle your bees, and then all of a sudden find you've got a problem when you've got nobody to help you, um, go to somebody else's bees, usually the beekeeping association, 
handle these. And if there's a problem, there's going to be somebody there who can help you uh, help you out. Now, you probably will swell up. Some people take this as being an allergy. It's not an, uh, not an allergy. It's a, it's a natural thing that happens. Most people swell up when they, uh, when they get stung. And that's probably the main reason that I've seen for people giving up very, very quickly. And over the years, there have been ever so many people that I've come across. They start bee, beekeeping with great gusto, uh, get stung a couple of times, realize it's a bit more painful than they, they thought it was. And all of a sudden, we uh, we have an email or a phone call. Uh, I'm allergic. I've got to give up. They're not actually allergic. They're um, probably um, actually frightened of being stung. So you need to be aware of these. Now, it's easy enough to say, oh, yeah, I'll put on protective clothing. Uh, well, it may avoid some of the stinging, but it won't avoid all the stings. And in some instances, it could even be uh, worse. So when you're handling bees, <clears throat> that's what you'll be up against. There's me handling the colony and Martin uh, right next to me. Martin's good beekeeper. Been keeping bees now for 10-ish years, uh, something like that. Might even be 12 by now. But that's the sort of thing that you're going to be up against. Not a couple of fluffy little bees in a box. So you need to be uh, quite aware of this. That is quite a strong colony. If you look at the pile on the left, there are three supers there. There could well be, I don't know, 40, 50, perhaps even 60 pound of honey on those. And I suspect Martin was there to help me. Um, with the with the lifting but that's the sort of thing you're going to be against <clears throat> um, here's one of our members i don't can't recognize them uh, uh from uh, uh from much there um this is what you're dealing with when you're handling the colony of bees you'll be removing frames with lots of bees on like that so you need to be aware of that before you um uh, before you start it's not just a couple of a couple of bees on a frame uh, that you might see at an agricultural show or something because um, with a situation like that, um, all the flying bees will probably have been milked off um, so that, um, so that you, you, you've only got um, a smallish number of bees there and certainly nothing that will, will fly. I'm not trying to put you off. I'm just trying to tell you that these are the sort of things that you, uh, you will uh, come, uh, come across. This is one of our members <clears throat> at Whisper Green. She's been keeping bees now, best part of 20 years. Very, very good beekeeper. And um, she, with her partner, have got around about 100 colonies they're managing now as part of their uh, living. Somebody like that is well worth learning from, even if you don't have to ask them questions. Of watch what they're doing. See how they go about, um, uh, about managing a colony of bees. And um, if you're capable of, Picking things up in that way, you'll learn an awful lot. You need to be responsible. <clears throat> Try to keep bees for the right reasons. Um, you perhaps either want honey or you want to study them or whatever. If you are thinking of keeping bees just to save the bees because you've heard they're in trouble and that sort of thing, please, 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 Think again about that, because uh, most people involved with beekeeping associations have had problems with people thinking that, are oh, they going to save the bees by just having a colony of bees at the bottom of the garden and not do anything to them? Well, they can become sick. Um, they can um, expand, which is uh, swarming, uh, and uh, they can cause problems elsewhere you will very, very definitely not be saving anything um, by just having the bottom bees at the garden. It's almost like keeping chicken just to save birds. When you get involved with beekeeping, try and learn good handling techniques as well, because um, if you use, use crash bang methods, uh, you could easily uh, fire bees up, wind them up. They get um, uh, a bit defensive. Um, both you, neighbours, and uh, and the household get um, a little bit of a, um, a, a, a little bit of a stinging. Have a look at the um, uh, the way bees uh, behave, 
And you'll probably find that if you go to a beekeeping association, um, that uh, the same colony of bees will behave differently depending on who handles it. And it could just be that somebody is nice and gentle uh, and they use the right amount of smoke. Uh, I won't talk too much about handling smoke at, at the moment. That will come with the next um, uh, next one. Um, and, and somebody else is very rough and they're sort of ripping uh, frames out of the hive, winding the bees up. So just have a look and see what, what's, um, what's happening. Try and learn from other people by watching. You, 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 don't, um, uh, you, don't do, uh, you don't learn very much by reading a book or whatever uh, in, in that type. Um, there are what I call the basics, which are simple, factual things such as the life cycles, uh, disease recognition, and that sort of thing. Um, try to learn some of those uh, in the early stage and uh, there is enough to learn uh, most books have have got them or so, some of them have got slight variations but that's that's not not um, not too much of a worry if you learn the absolute basics a lot of the management techniques that you might have explained to you or suggested to you uh, you can work out what they're trying to achieve and if things go wrong or, or not try to carefully cite your hives as well um don't put them uh, where they're going to be a nuisance to anybody else i'll talk about that a little bit later on keep nice and gentle bees if you can um there are some bees that are that are let's say um a little bit hotter than others and um the uh the temper of a colony can change a little bit if they do change queens, it's, it's, it's beyond what we're talking about uh, uh, today. Um, but you need to be aware of these things. So, so just sort of charging in and getting whatever bees are available may not be the best, um, uh, the best solution. And please, please, please try to avoid what we call bee fever. Now, this is the, um, uh, the people who've only just started um, get to incredibly enthusiastic and all of a sudden get um, uh, far more bees than they're capable of looking after. <coughs> um, one instance I remember is only a couple of three years ago, I gave a, a whole day a presentation to a, a, um, a beekeeping association. There were about 15 or 18 people there, including a youngish uh, couple, and they were probably in the early 30s, I would think, and they had got... 30 colonies, they had only been keeping bees one full season. They'd never been to uh, any um, uh, beekeeping association meeting or anything like that. And those two were um, knew less than everybody else. They were, they just roared around, got 30 colonies of bees from here, there and everywhere, and they didn't know how to look after them. So please, please, please just... Just um, be a little bit careful on the numbers you get early on. Discipline. Beekeepers don't often realise that we're actually dealing with biology. <clears throat> so the colony um, uh, develops throughout the year and goes into um, a decline as well for the, uh, 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 for the winter. Also, the, um, the brood, there's development stages of that. Uh, and... The, the bees won't actually wait for you. If you put something off to tomorrow or, or next week or whatever, um, you could end up with a, a situation that you, that you rather not have. Very often, things need to be done in good time in beekeeping. The main problem during the summer is what's called swarming, where um, a proportion of the adult bees and the queen take off to form another nest somewhere. Uh, they give us warning. They tell us what they're doing. Uh, and, um, but there's a trigger. And within, literally within seconds, they are out and uh, they're gone. Now, if those bees decide that they want to go and live in somebody else's chimney, that then gives a massive problem uh, locally, not necessarily for you, but, but for somebody else, and also the new beekeeper who never wanted to be a beekeeper in the first place. Now, you can 
stop swarming or you've got a fairly good chance of swarming if you do things at the right time. But you've got to do them at the right time because tomorrow may well be too late. Good beekeepers are very caring and they're understanding as well. What you've got to remember is that food is, uh, sorry, honey is food. And the uh, bees that produce it are um, legally food producing animals. Um, but unfortunately, they don't have the same protection as other food producing uh, animals like cows, sheep or, or pigs or goats or whatever. And I have seen some dreadful things done to bees that if they were done to uh, animals, um, the owners would be uh, locked up. But you need to make sure that you, you look after them. They need caring, exactly the same as a you know dog or a cat, not that, not that they're food-producing animals, but they, 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 they need looking after. They occasionally get, uh, get sick. That's not necessarily a fault of the uh, beekeeper. Um, very often you can get uh, over sickness, sometimes with just fairly simple management techniques. <coughs> if it needs a bit more, perhaps they might need uh, a bit of treatment, which may be uh, perhaps chemical, hard or soft, uh, or perhaps again, um, uh, management techniques will get, will, will get over most of the problems. Beekeepers must realise that they are food-producing animals. Go back to the top line. They are not fluffy pets. Not fluffy pets. So time. Well, things work out quite well in beekeeping because you can do things on a 7- or 14-day cycle. <coughs> Fits in quite neatly. Most people work on one or the other. Um, occasionally things need to be done uh, in between uh, but that does mean that you can be a weekend beekeeper if you want to so if you perhaps you've got a job um, that where you, you you work away uh, uh, perhaps a week or, or whatever uh, you can do your beekeeping uh, weekend beekeepers are pretty good really right in my experience they are if you need anything done within the seven or 14 days, um, so on a Wednesday or a Thursday or something, uh, it usually doesn't take very long, you know, five or 10 minutes, something like that. And what you very often find is other beekeepers uh, will probably quite easily help you. <clears throat> now, when you're handling bees and you're inspecting them or whatever, um, I think you could probably allow half hour to, uh, assemble the kit you need. You light the smoker and get it, or well, get it out of the shed, light the smoker and that sort of thing, uh, and then uh, put it away when you finish. You you want to put your protective clothing on. Um, perhaps you might need extra bits and pieces to take uh, to your hives. Um, so half hour, I think, is probably uh, quite uh, adequate. This is at home. If you've got your bees away, then obviously to add a little bit for transport and that sort of thing. Now, for a beginner. <clears throat> perhaps the first year uh, or so, um, perhaps half an hour, a little bit more uh, per colony. It will take you a bit longer because you're trying to find, find things out and you're probably learning uh, about half an hour. It's not good to keep bees open very long because it does stress them and uh, stress then opens up very, uh, various other um, uh, uh, possibilities for them so perhaps half an hour a um, little bit more once you become experienced second third fourth year or whatever you ought to be able to do most things in 10 to 15 minutes okay sometimes it's going to be five other times it's going to be 20 but averaging out probably 10 or 15 minutes for a reasonably experienced beekeeper but that's not the end of it because um you if you've got a good beekeeping association uh if you attend uh, 10 meetings, uh, that, of course, is going to take up more time than it will uh, you handling your own bees. But there again, uh, you're going to learn, which could cut down the time it takes you to handle your own uh, bees. Then there are other things that you need to do at various times of the year, which aren't don't really have the same sort of uh, time constraints. 
those things like you need, may need to extract your honey <coughs> or perhaps uh, feed your bees or make equipment or mend equipment, those sort of things. Um, with most of those, it doesn't really matter whether you do them today or tomorrow or sometimes uh, next week, but it is all time that you will need to, uh, uh, need to spend. Uh, therapy, some people call it. As a beekeeper, you need to be quite observant and possess lateral thinking as well. It's great to know what normal is. If you know what normal is, if you spot anything that's different, um, you can uh, you can sort it out. Now it may be good, or perhaps not so good. Um, very often you go to a colony, and a colony of bees is telling you something all the time, even if there's nothing wrong with it. If they say to you, "Right, we're doing absolutely fine. Uh, we're healthy. We've got enough food." Um, and uh, we're not going to cause you any more problems for another few weeks. Um, that's okay. Close them down, um, and uh, uh, away you go. Uh, go and have a cup of tea, or you no, know, read a book, or, or, or whatever. Uh, bad things can vary quite a bit. When I say bad, I don't. Uh, perhaps things that need attention. Then, uh, perhaps I um, didn't word that too well. It could be that they've got a notifiable. Uh, disease that's absolutely worst uh, worst case or it could just be that the bees need a little bit of uh, something perhaps a bit of space uh, extra soup or something of that nature which really is uh, as much as anything positive rather than negative so it's not bad but it, it needs attention <clears throat> you should know what's happening in the colony and what is going to happen perhaps uh, tomorrow or three days' time or uh, next week or, or whatever, that's where your lateral thinking comes in because uh, you need to have a little bit of knowledge to know how the colony is going to grow, how it's going to perhaps fit into the space um, that you've uh, left it. And it may just be that if, let's say, the weather, is, uh, weather forecast is good for the next week, it could vary quite a bit depending on um, or the, the needs of the colony could vary quite a bit depending on <clears throat> on the weather. And, of course, it helps you um, develop the colony uh, to, um, uh, 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 to produce um, the honey that both you and the colony uh, needs. A suitable site. I'll sort of get back to this. Um, you need a bit of room to work uh, and move around. Um, you need, you saw what, me at the hive, supers need to be put down. So effectively, you need at least double the size of the, uh, the hive itself. <laughs> Plus the fact that you yourself need to uh, move around. So even if you've got a fairly small space, you can generally do quite well. But of course, you might need to keep hedges trimmed and and uh, and that sort of thing. So it effectively makes more uh, space for you. Try to make sure it's not a nuisance, especially to uh, to neighbours. So try not to put your uh, your your hive or hives up against a um, uh, a neighbour's boundary, facing their their, their way. Um, there, there are reasons why, a case in why perhaps you, you would be able to do that, uh, but not if there's no, um, no hedging or fencing or anything of that nature. Keep away from public, public footpaths as well. So uh, if you've got um, a public footpath at the bottom of your garden or the field that you've got, the, um, uh, got your bees in, try to keep them away from uh, the footpath because sooner or later, Somebody is going to get stung. It might not even be your bees, but they would get. They would definitely get the blame. Um, also, uh, if you've got a let, let's say a big hedge the other side, the um, at the bottom of your garden, if there's something like a, a footpath or a or a bus stop or something like that the other side, then then be sensible. Don't just put bees the other, the other side of the hedge. Most rural locations are usually okay. <clears throat> and I had an email from somebody today who actually doesn't live very far from me. I think they say they've got about 12 or 13 acres. Whatever you've got, 12 or 13 acres, it's going to be big enough for a, 
uh, a hive of bees or a couple of hive of bees somewhere, probably big enough for 30, but, um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a slightly different matter. It's, that's beyond the uh, beginner stage. And you need somewhere to store your equipment. Probably the biggest things are going to be um, a spare hive or perhaps a, a couple or perhaps uh, supers, some of which could be stored outside if you are short of space. But shed or a garage or whatever is probably adequate for the ordinary beekeeper. And these days there are some really good um, portable, um, uh, more or less shedlets, I suppose you'd call them, uh, the small, small things, which is quite adequate for um, uh, for the uh, ordinary beekeeper. Most people will probably be able to get the bees uh, in their garden. Uh, some of them aren't big enough, but most people should be able to get bees in the garden. If not, most people will probably be able to find somewhere else. Uh, it could be a little bit of woodland or a corner of a field or uh, a paddock or somebody else's garden. <clears throat> that is what we in beekeeping terms call uh, an, an out apiary. If you do go down that route, don't forget that you're going to have to cut um, your kit probably from home if you have got nowhere to um, uh, to store it there. It might be possible to have a joint apiary. So perhaps in a in an urban area where you, where most people seem to have this this problem, uh, perhaps it could be uh, an ap apiary site. Could be anywhere. Could be perhaps on a factory estate uh, or somewhere like that uh, behind behind a, a a factory bit of wasteland. Uh, where two, three, four, half a dozen of you can um, uh, uh, can you keep there, keep your bees there. <clears throat> I've done speaking and demonstrating in uh, urban beekeeping associations, but I haven't been uh, involved with them. So I don't know too much about them, but it seems to me that most urban beekeeping associations I come across uh, are keen to help their members. So they'll probably know of... Uh, areas where you you can keep bees so if you've um if you've got no garden you perhaps live in a flat or something like that then you can keep bees without uh, too much of a problem here's one situation it's uh, it's an allotment site <clears throat> actually in a in, in a country town although they call it a town it's a, uh, there are a lot of villages bigger than that um, this is on allotment you see the sheds on the left on the right hand side uh, you can just see the bottom of a greenhouse there. So between the two of them, though that box of bees there is 18 inches square, uh, 460 millimetres. So there's probably, oh, you're struggling to get a metre and a half there. Those bees were kept there quite successfully for several years. They have been moved out now, but there's room in there for a couple of, couple of hives of bees. Okay, the area might be a bit cramped um, and you need to be uh, quite well organised to make sure that you don't um, uh, don't put things around where your feet are because you, you might trip over. <coughs> uh, they were very, very successful in that, uh, that area. They've only moved out into the rest of the allotment uh, at the moment, but it is possible. Um, don't, put, uh, don't put things in, in the way like that because you can generally get around it. Here's a garden um, down in the West Country, and there's five hives of bees there. Um, you can see it's the bottom of the vegetable patch. Personally, the, 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 um, the hives are facing this way. Personally, I would have turned them round, um, but it's none of my business. It wasn't my, um, uh, my apiary, and the, uh, the owner was a beekeeper uh, anyway. If you turn them round, the bees will fly up, see the wall, and just go straight up way above head height. If they're facing this direction, then um, the chances are the bees might come out at around about head height. So when you're doing your gardening, they could be a little bit of a nuisance. Shed nice and close. I don't know what was in it, um, but um, uh, that's uh, that would be good for storage. And for those hives there, probably wouldn't take up much more about half the... Um, uh, half the area of the shed. <clears throat> Here's a different situation. It's a rural village. <clears throat> uh, 
fairly close to me. In fact, um, the uh, tree line behind is a scarp slope of the South Downs. Uh, but that's just the corner of a, um, a, a small paddock. And um, well, in total, I think there was something like six, six hives there. Uh, absolutely uh, ideal, no problem uh, at all. Now, understanding family and uh, neighbours, you've got to work with them, folks. It's no good just um, uh, uh, going to them and uh, saying, right, I'm going to be a beekeeper. Have a chat with them because um, they may not be quite so enthusiastic about your uh, uh, your intended hobby than, uh, than, than, than you are. Uh, or be supportive. And just because you think you, oh, I'll keep the bees away, um, might not be quite so easy because um, uh, you could be bringing bees home. Now, on the other hand, uh, there are many families where one person is the beekeeper and other people get involved for various um, reasons. Uh, a typical one is hive products because um, although some people don't want to be beekeepers. Uh, they're quite happy to use perhaps the honey in cooking or um, in the kitchen, uh, or perhaps the beeswax, turn into candles or cosmetics or whatever, <clears throat> or even, um, you know, things like photography. Gumption, common sense and practical ability. Um, great things that um, all beekeepers, I think, should be, uh, 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 be owners of. Because beekeeping is actually hands-on, hands-on. Everybody's got to get their head stuck in a, in a bee whether they like it or not. You need to be in a position to work things out. I've already mentioned um, uh, lateral thinking. You've got to be able to say, hang on, I've got a bit of a problem here. Um, what can I do to ease, ease the uh, situation on the, uh, on the bees? I have to say some struggle, but... It's exactly the same as the work situation where some people are better at one job than, the, the, than, an, than another. You need to be practical. <clears throat> it's not just the bees itself. Um, there are all sorts of things that need uh, making or repairing, things like frames, stuff needs cleaning. Um, perhaps a, a high roof might need a bit, of, a bit of repair. Easy enough to do, but um, there is a practical element to it. But I found bees being the best teachers. The best teachers in beekeeping, in my view, have got six legs and they've got four wings. They haven't got two uh, two legs and they sit in front of a screen or stand in front of an audience and uh, uh, and tell you about things. It's much, much better and easier to learn that way than from a book or the internet. Um, you just cannot learn the practical side of, of beekeeping, which I think is probably the biggest, uh, biggest uh, element. And I'll talk about books and internet a bit later. So what do you actually need then to be a beekeeper? Well, actually not very much. <clears throat> you clearly need a hive or something to keep them in. It's handy from time to time, time to have spare hive parts, which is no real problem. I don't mean masses and masses of kit. Uh, I just mean a few uh, odd bits and pieces. You need to con Calm your bees and, and control them. So you need a smoker and you need a hive tool for getting into the hive because it, they do get stuck up, but all this will be covered in the, um, in the one day e event. Um, you need some protective clothing as well. And I suggest as an absolute minimum, uh, you cover your head up. You saw Martin and myself. We only had basic uh, head protection. Uh, we didn't have gloves. We didn't have bee suits. We didn't have Wellingtons or whatever. Um, but I suggest very, very strongly that certainly in the early stages, you have at least uh, a veil because um, even after 50 some odd years, I very, very rarely handle a colony of bees without, um, uh, without head protection. <clears throat> you can go either online or you can get a beekeeping catalogue. And quite frankly, uh, there's a whole load of junk in uh, most of them. And they'll obviously convince you that you need them. All you're going to do is just fill your shit up with something and you won't be able to find whatever it is if, if indeed you need it because it's got a load more junk on top of it. So be very, very careful what you buy and uh, only, only what you need. And then, of course, you need uh, bees. Pretty obvious, really. 
So all of this has got some sort of cost. What is it? Well, <clears throat> huh. pretty widespread there. Could be zero if um, if you're lucky enough to be in a position to have somebody to uh, uh, to give you kit. Um, over the years, I've uh, I've seen some very lucky people that somebody perhaps has just given up beekeeping, and uh, they may have taken somebody on as a um, uh, as a as a beginner to help them. Uh, they've liked their approach and they've just given them their kit. You know, here it is. Um, uh, go and go and enjoy yourself. Um, or if you want to pay top whack for absolutely everything and get or the the the, uh, uh, the most gleaming uh, bits you can uh, get and the top quality and all the rest of it, you can easily spend a couple of three thousand. But the reality is somewhere in between. And for the ordinary beekeeper, you could probably, um, if you're a, a little bit patient and you wait for your bees, you could probably start for, let's say, low hundreds, certainly mid hundreds, 500 pound or so will well cover you. But what you've got to remember is it is a hobby. Um, and it doesn't matter what hobby you get is usually um, a, a little bit of a, co a cost to it. Um, some people uh, uh, play golf or uh, whatever. Um, I know somebody who, uh, who plays bridge and she tends to go uh, on um, uh, all over the place playing bridge. And of course, there's a travel cost to that. It might be easy to say, oh, I'll, uh, I'll go walking. There's no cost to that. Oh, yes, there is. Uh, walking boots, waterproofs, um, uh, even a sandwich to take with you costs you something. Uh, so the, you expect a hobby to uh, to cost you something, but the brilliant benefits of beekeeping it gets you outside, gets you away from the screen as much as anything. <clears throat> there are loads and loads and loads of things to learn, and it's not just about the bees; it's the surroundings as well, uh, the various uh, flowers and um, uh, all sorts of things that might perhaps want to. Um, uh, to reside in your hive roof. There's quite a lot of interesting things there. Of course, associated interests, some of which I've touched on, uh, might be candle making, cosmetics. Um, uh, perhaps you're interested in anatomy uh, of insects. You know, there's all sorts of things like that um, uh, that, um, that you can take up. There are ongoing costs, um, but they are, I think, what one might term minimal. <clears throat> perhaps the cost of uh, membership of your local uh, beekeeping association, which at the moment they're probably somewhere between 20 and 30 pound, uh, something of that nature, some a bit less, some a little bit more. Um, bees may need feeding, uh, although if you leave them uh, uh, some honey, you won't have to feed them, so what, there won't be a cost there. Uh, there might be a little bit of uh, medication, uh, and there may well be some uh, repairs and replacements, but not very, very much. Um, I'm guessing here um, most colonies probably 20 or 30 pound, but then look at the honey and the beeswax you can get in return. Now, you may recover some of that because if you sell a little bit of honey, and I'm not suggesting beginners do straight away because there are some regulations that you uh, you need to comply with, um, they're all fairly simple. Don't 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 get frightened about it. But you can um, sell a little bit of honey um, to re pro probably recover all your costs. I would think. Uh, information. Uh, we all need that. Um, there's a massive problem with information, as far as I'm concerned, because it is of a general nature. And uh, just take the area that we cover, which is um, the British Islands and uh, Ireland. Um, things vary considerably throughout that area, uh, climate and conditions mainly. And certainly uh, Cornwall is going to be, uh, keeping bees in Cornwall is going to be quite different than uh, Northumberland. And um, perhaps up in the Welsh Hills is going to be different than um, uh, than the flatlands of East Anglia, which is going to be different than uh, Ireland. And even if you go to Ireland, islands, um, or you know you think they might be small, um, 
the uh, conditions can be very, very variable on those. So um, that's one objection I've got to uh, general uh, information. You've also got to take into account that um, uh, we're dealing with land. And some areas can be very marginal uh, for bees. Others can be uh, very good. And when I say marginal, it could be because <clears throat> there isn't, well, mainly because there isn't much forage. And it could be because perhaps you're in an a agricultural desert in East Anglia or perhaps uh, up in the hills where you've got altitude, which is one problem uh, because it's generally a couple of degrees, three degrees cooler there. But also if it's sheep country, um, sheep country is traditionally not great for bees, um, I assume, because of miniaturization of, uh, uh, of plants. They clearly need a suitable forage, but I think probably most areas of the country will certainly support uh, a couple of uh, couple of hives of uh, bees. Seek advice from your local beekeepers. <clears throat> they may or may not be members of the local beekeeping association, um, and you can also seek advice uh, from them because people who've kept bees in a certain area for several years, we'll know what's of what's available and uh, what to um, uh, what 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 to do. It could be something simple like um, you're in a heather area, uh, perhaps North York Moors or the Peak District or somewhere like that. Now, uh, keeping uh, bees in heather districts is quite a bit different than just a pure um, uh, agricultural uh, area. And then, of course, uh, the locations, because urban beekeeping is quite a bit different than rural. Um, I've been very rural all my, uh, my life, so that's what I know. Um, but I do speak and get involved quite a lot with urban beekeepers, and it's very, very different keeping bees uh, in urban environment than it is rural. So you need local help. <clears throat> Wherever you are in the area that we're covering, which I've just mentioned, um, there is a beekeeping association that covers it. <laughs> okay, there are a few islands that haven't got their own dedicated association, uh, but there are national ones which will uh, cover you, or perhaps the nearest uh, county one. If you're, um, uh, you know, if you let's say, I, I know the Silly Isles. They've probably only got a dozen or fifteen beekeepers. No beekeeping association there, um, but I assume, but I don't know that they. Um, uh, they latch onto the Cornwall Beekeeping Association or one of the Cornwall Beekeeping Association. They do vary. They're run by volunteers and uh, they've got um, different ways of doing things, uh, different attitudes and that sort of thing. So um, uh, get involved with the local beekeeping association and they should be able to help you, but be prepared that they don't always work the same way. Some of, them are, some of them are pretty good at running courses and loads of practical teaching, perhaps with a uh, with a teaching apron. In fact, many associations have got teaching aprons these days, but some of them haven't. They find other ways of doing their teaching, and you've got to go and have a chat with them and see if the way they do things is the way that you want to want to learn. Many of them have got a category of membership for uh, non uh, beekeepers. Uh, which typically is about a third of the price. Certainly at Whisper Green it is. I think our main, well, say quarter price, our main is um, £29, main membership is £29, and our non-beekeeping member I think is seven. Search the internet. Have a look, see what there is locally. Just put in your county or, or, or whatever. You may end up with several options. Uh, what you've also got to understand is that in some areas you get a county association, which is then split up into uh, several groups, which could be called a branch or, or, or a division. So um, if you put your own town in, you may well end up with, um, uh, with at least two, two associations. One may just be affiliated to the other. So just have a look, look, um, look for that. But I can tell you that they're best place to help you and advise you because they're the ones that are that know the beekeeping or should know the beekeeping 
in their area. <clears throat> now you're going to need a hive. So which type of hive to go for? You might think, oh, they're all the same. I'll just go and, go and get a hive. That must be the cheapest one or what, what, what somebody says. Be careful. There are about 20 types uh, readily available plus variations. Now, the frames that go inside the hive, uh, they do vary in size. And what fits one may not fit another. So if you, if you start off with one type of hive, it's very often difficult to change once a decision has been made because you've then, it's not easy to change bees from one type of frame uh, to another. And um, uh, it might even be easier just to give your bees away or sell them and then, 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 then start afresh. That's one area that I'm, I'm pretty certain that um, most people have uh, problems with, certainly beginners. The problem is, is it's easy to be persuaded. Go online and, and, and see somebody's website or some other organization's website. It, it, I won't say they'll send you down the wrong road, but they are um, pretty good at telling you what they think and not necessarily very good at uh, telling you what other, other people think or what may suit you better. There are very few people who have experience with all of them. Um, I mean, the probably a couple of hive types that I haven't um, handled bees in, but most of them I have. The vast majority of beekeepers will only, um, uh, will only experience um, one or perhaps two different, uh, different types of hives. So they're not in the, really in the best position to give you uh, advice. What's called the national hive is the most common throughout um, the um, uh, uh, throughout um, the area that we're talking about. This is British National. Be careful because you can go online and you can get National Hives. Sometimes it's not the same thing because there's a German National uh, as well. And you might end up with something that doesn't, doesn't um, it's incompatible with everything else and it doesn't, uh, doesn't really fit. Now, I'm not just suggesting that you, you go for the uh, National because in Scotland, you may well have um, be, um, uh, may well be advised to go for uh, the Smith Hive, which to a certain degree is, it's got the same frame size as National, but they're, 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 they're modified. So I've, if somebody offers you a National Hive, um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's very, very cheap, have a chat with somebody, um, and that's the one that I think I would probably go for. But try and get experience of handling several types uh, first. Some beekeeping associations have got more than one type of hive. Uh, others haven't. They've only just got one. Certainly at Whisper Green, we've only just got one. And that's the one we recommend to, uh, to everybody. But if you can get a little bit of experience, then, uh, then do so. That could be different beekeepers. But please, please, please don't just rush into it because it could be something you, that you uh, regretted. Uh, information sources, they're actually very variable, <coughs> as I'm sure anybody who's done a bit of reading about um, uh, a piece of beekeeping will, uh, will know. Quite a lot of it's good, but there's also some either poor information or some inappropriate. And when I say inappropriate, if you read about beekeeping, let's say in California, it's going to be very, very different um, than in um, in our climate, in our, our situation, the beekeeping um, a part of it. And there is quite a lot these days, I'm afraid, of what I call cut and paste because a lot of information is given by fairly new beekeepers. They don't know um, much themselves because they haven't been in beekeeping any length of time. Um, so... Uh, they want to give out information because they've, they've just set up this new website or whatever. Um, so just cut and paste up something, including mistakes from elsewhere. So be careful. What options have we got? We've got books. We've got websites, <laughs> online videos. National beekeeping associations um, have got some reasonable advice. And, of course, local beekeeping association. But as a potential beekeeper, how do you actually know what the quality of that advice is? Um, 
Well, it's one uh, one area where you're probably going to make quite a lot of mistakes because you may even decide yourself after a short time you've gone down the wrong road. You've got to pick on on something else. Um, books, I've got um, uh, a, a few suggestions uh, for you. Uh, websites we'll try and cover in the all day event. Online videos, be very, very careful because it's the easiest thing in the world for somebody to, uh, to start a new hobby, um, get a phone and, um, uh, and give the impression that they're a, uh, they're a top notch beekeeper. And I have to say as an experienced beekeeper, um, there are some rather poor online videos out there, which is, which is sad really. So which books then? <clears throat> well, I'm going to suggest three um, uh, for you um, for, for several reasons. They're good for non-beekeepers and starters because there's, uh, everything there is explained in, in, uh, in fairly good detail and absolute plain English as well. Much of what's, uh, what's there is also relevant to more experienced beekeepers as well. So it's not just a case of buying a book for the first year and then chucking it over your left shoulder um, because it's, you've, you've grown out of it. Because all three of them have got information that, that should suit you well into your uh, beekeeping uh, years. They've all got sound information and I've chosen them because there's little conflict. Okay, there, there, there are a, a few things that people will do uh, differently. Um, but apart from that, everything is, is, is going to be fairly similar. Two out of the three that I'm going to give you uh, are definitely in print, and one will be reprinted uh, sometime, hopefully, in the next, uh, next few months. So this is the first one. Bees at the Bottom of the Garden uh, by uh, Alan Campion. Personally, I think it's well written. It's nice and easy to understand for uh, everybody. And the great thing about it is, so you can <coughs> excuse me, uh, you can go back and uh, you you can reread it, and you the second time you read it, uh, you should have got it. It can be read in an evening, so it's a nice, easy book. Um, but it is, I think, it's, it's not a criticism. It's fairly shallow, which makes it really good for um, uh, potential beekeepers. This here is an absolute cracking book, in my opinion, uh, Better Beginnings for Beekeepers, um, by a man called Adrian Waring, who was an incredibly good beekeeper. He's only died 12 months ago, I suppose, uh, something like that. He was at one stage the beekeeping advisor for Northamptonshire. It's very well written. Again, it could be read in an evening. Um it's slightly more advanced than uh, bees at the bottom of the garden, so it's going to last you a, a bit longer, but still of a basic nature that you can understand it. Now, it is due to be reprinted uh, uh, fairly soon. If you can get a second-hand copy, uh, then uh, 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 snap it up, I would. And then there's one here which I'm afraid is, um, is mine, uh, Beekeeping Practical Guide. But you need to be careful because of the American book of the same uh, title. Uh, I had no uh, choice of the title. That's the one that the, um, uh, the publishers decided they wanted. And despite me telling them was an, another one of the same title, no, that's it. That's what we want. <sighs> it is in greater depth than the previous two. It was originally written for uh, beginners, um, but there is more information in it. Out and out beginners, I meant. Um, but I've had so many people been keeping bees 20 or 30 years have come to me and said, look, they, they, they still get quite a lot of um, uh, good information from it. And uh, that is readily available. It's on eBay and all, all sorts of booksellers. I'm suggesting strongly that you try to avoid foreign material. Uh, books, websites, videos, those sort of things. And for several reasons. They've got different conditions, um, different climatic conditions uh, or whatever, perhaps different kinds of bees. And uh, bees aren't bees aren't bees. There are uh, quite, quite, um, uh, quite large differences between uh, some of them. They're almost certain to have 
uh, different hives than us. We've got a, a British standard hive, which most people use, which is a national I was talking to you about. You won't see that anywhere uh, else or not in any great numbers anyway. It might be small numbers. I've seen one or two in Holland, but that's about all. Um, uh, we can use theirs, and some of their their standard ones are available here, but because there's no out-and-out -out standard, uh, some of the sizes vary a bit, so there's, there's a bit of incompatibility. Um, they will cert almost certainly use uh, different methods because of the different conditions and the bees, and the most important thing is legislation, of course, because if they suggest something to you, that's not uh, legal here or it's not registered or something here. It could be a some sort of treatment, some sort of chemical or something like that. Um, you can be breaking the law here where you wouldn't uh, abroad. So be very, very careful. Uh, I won't mention any names, but, the, but just have a look inside, see where it's published. I'm suggesting to you that you don't charge off buying any equipment and you, you, you think, oh, yeah, I can do all that. Please, please, please don't go buying any equipment because you may well be able to do without it. A lot of things in uh, the catalogs I was telling you about, you may only use one day a year. Um, now, you can very often either borrow from another beekeeper or improvise with, uh, with uh, something else. So wait until you know what you need. And at that point, it really should be that you've had a chat with your local beekeeping association, the people who are teaching you, and um, uh, you've come to the conclusion that you should really start be could really start beekeeping yourself. Also, these days the quality can be very variable too. Uh, if you go back thirty years or so, where everything was made in this country by the appliance uh, manufacturers uh, and dealers, um, these days um, there's a lot of cheap imported stuff coming in and you get hive tools that you can cut yourself on and all sorts of things like that. So be very, very careful. Uh, and please, please, please don't go charging off buying bees either <laughs> because they may, it's certainly if you buy them online, um, they may be uh, imported and there are well-known problems with uh, those. Virtually everywhere there are local bees uh, available, red, quite readily available, Try and buy some bees when you get uh, uh, when you get to that point. Try and buy bees that are uh, suitable for your areas. They're going to survive um, and they're not going to uh, fall, fall over because they don't suit our climate. So here's a summary of um, what I hope I've said. Um, beekeeping, in my view, is a pretty good hobby. Um, in fact, I really ought to cross good out. Brilliant, because I think it is. There's lots and lots and lots of interest, not just what's inside the hive, but lots of other things going on as well. Personally, I think it's nice and easy to learn. Um, okay, some people have uh, difficulty, and some people make things a lot more complicated than they need be. But at a basic level, which is um, suitable for the vast majority of beekeepers, it's nice and easy to learn. If you do struggle, there's plenty of good help, local beekeeping association or a good, sound local beekeeper. Um, so join local beekeeping association if you can um, and uh, aim to be a good, caring, knowledgeable and understanding beekeeper. You will probably find out there are lots and lots and lots of opinions. The reason there are lots of opinions is because people just very often do things their own way. They're not aware of uh, other methods, other ways of doing things. And, of course, their way is always best. So you've got to be a little bit careful about that. I hope that gave you an idea of what's involved in beekeeping, um, the amount of time you need and commitment and that sort of thing. Uh, it really leads into an online course, Introduction to Beekeeping, which is six sessions um, just less than six hours total, which the cost is just £15. There won't be enough uh, for you to um, uh, keep bees, but it will cover much of what the potential beekeepers ask, including 
How to start beekeeping, uh, where to start your hives, if not perhaps in your own garden, but perhaps somebody else's uh, property. The three types of bees there are in a beehive, uh, the queens, the drones, and the workers. How and where you can learn about honeybees and the various information sources. And I have to say that uh, some of them are very good and others have, let's say, uh, at best unreliable. What happens in a beehive and where? A little bit about what happens during the beekeeping year, um, what to do and when. Um, and bear in mind that beekeeping is seasonal. Um, there are different things to do at different times of the year and uh, different uh, levels of uh, commitment as well. Obtaining bees and equipment is actually very important, uh, and we'll be discussing that. There are lots of different hive types, probably 10 or a dozen or, or more, and you really need to uh, try and get the one that's going to suit you best uh, as soon as you start beekeeping. Otherwise, it's expensive to change. So a little bit of information about how to choose and why. Any protective clothing you might need. Uh, the cost, which is one of the first things that a lot of people uh, ask. Also, the time and commitment uh, needed. I hope you take uh, the next step, whatever that is. And uh, if you do, uh, beekeeping, I think you'll find is fun.